Hi, thanks for joining me today for my second book review and we have a distinctly nautical theme. So in the mid 80s, I worked for a company called BCA, central London, just off of Tottenham Court Road. You probably won't recognise the name BCA, but if I say Book Club Associates, that might bring back some memories of flyers in every Sunday supplement, leaflets that fell out of every magazine you bought, and I'm sure you would have seen the offers for buy three books for £1.50 and then we'll send you a book every month for the rest of your life. <laughs> and I had a number of clubs relating to specific interests. Uh, one of them was Railway and funnily enough one of the biggest sellers of all time. It, it was something like the title was something like Great Eastern Railway Timetables 1928 to 1935 Part 1. <laughs> And I guess these were bought by model railway enthusiasts and what they were, as the name suggests, were simply reprints of actual rail timetables from that specific place and time. One good thing about working there, in fact, to be honest, pretty much the only good thing about working there was, as you can imagine, this was like a four storey office building full of books. and. What would happen is books would come in for review from the editors. Uh, obviously the publishers were trying to get these books into the BCA catalogue. So the editors would look through the books then when they'd finished they'd put them on a shelf. So these shelves were in a corridor filled with books, uh, quite, a, quite a big shelf, and the staff were basically allowed to pick up and take any book they wanted and just take it home. It was not going to get used, it wasn't going to be sold, I guess at some point they'd be cleared out and probably just pulped. So books were there for the taking, which to me, that's one of my ideas of heaven, right? And one of the books that I got is where, what we're looking at today. It's called Nelson's Navy. So at that time, I was just getting into naval Napoleonic wargaming, Age of Sail wargaming. And I guess my interest in that had been sparked by all those old films with Errol Flynn and Gregory Peck, all that sort of stuff. And also a series of paperbacks that I'd started reading by Alexander Kent. They centred around a character called Bolitho and it followed his career from a midshipman all the way through to Admiral. Real kind of rip-roaring Age of Sal adventure stuff. Then we're going to look at a book that I got this is in a second-hand bookshop. I can't even remember where or when. But uh, this is a 1978 first edition, and I paid £4 for it. And this is Building and Detailing Model Sailing Ships by George E. Campbell. So this goes much more into the technical detail, if you like, of how to put a model ship together. But let's start with the big book first. Nelson's Navy, The Ships, Men and Organisation, 1793 to 1815 and that's written by Brian Lavery or Lavery with a forward by Patrick O'Brien and this is a big heavy hardback book 35 pound back in the day though as I said I got my copy for free and it starts with the historical background so the wars with France early naval history the naval administration Britain and the world and throughout it's really nicely illustrated with a lot of contemporary paintings and drawings. And I love this type of picture. This is the defeat of the Spanish Armada. And as I said, these illustrations, they're not just of naval matters, but of society in general. So we've got a hanging going on there. This is entitled The Lower Classes at Billingsgate. <laughs> these lovely evocative old drawings from the time. So from there we get into ships, the types of ships, how they were designed and how they were constructed. And again we've got these wonderful old pictures from back in the day, even plans. And to me these were marvellous feats of engineering, these vessels. They must have been probably the largest and most complex machines, if we can call them that, of their day. 
So we go from our 100 gun ships, and there's a, a lovely model there. That's uh, the Boeing, a 98 gun ship launched in 1790. I do love these old models. Could never have one in the house because cats. We go through to the frigates that from what I gather were sort of like the workhorses of the Navy, used in several different roles. All the way down to your unrated sloops. We're taken through the whole process of shipbuilding, where they were built, Thames and Medway yards and how they were built, how they were fitted, and in particular the mast sails and riggings, which is a <laughs> an obscure art for most of us, I would imagine. And even on a relatively small ship such as this one, we can see just the amount of sails and the amount of rigging required to control those sails. And this sort of detail is great from the modelling point of view. I mean, maybe for one twelve hundredth, it's uh, a little bit more than is required. But any scales outside of that, particularly if you start getting into one six hundredth, then this is really valuable information for how to set up your rigging. Of course, warships need guns. So the next section is on armaments, particularly your cannons and your carronades. Now, a ship is nothing without a crew, so the next chapter looks at exactly that, the crew, starting with the officers. And again, we've got these wonderful prints of the time. There's a young man packing his chest before going off. And of course, that includes what life was like on the ships. As the caption says here, this is rather exaggerated. Look at the amount of space they've got there. The reality was much more something like this. Really cramped if you've ever been aboard the HMS Victory or similar. Of course, you will have seen that for yourself. Hundreds of men, well, mostly men, sometimes women, crammed into these tiny places. We've got a section on commissioned officers. So this basically gives you your rundown of all the officers on the typical ship, from the captain down to the surgeon, the midshipman, the admiral secretary, and so on and so on. So a lot of detail on organization, both on a fleet level and on each individual ship. There's information on how the ships are run on a day-to-day -day basis. You can imagine a lot of admin must have gone into sort of feeding all that crew, uh, making sure you've got all your ammunition and all your supplies and everything else. And then we get into recruitment. So we've spoken about officers already, and a lot of those will be volunteers, of course, or will be following in the family tradition. Not everyone had the same idea, so we had the press gangs working as well for your regular crew. But there were other methods of recruiting as well, so we get your flyers and leaflets and posters that would have been handed out. Bounties will be given by His Majesty in addition to two months advance. That must have been quite tempting if you were perhaps running a farm and weren't having a, a very good year with your crops. And some of the crew would be sort of drunks that were picked up and arrested or taken from places like Fleet Debtors Prison. So I guess given the choice between a really horrible cell and life on board a ship, you'd be quite tempted to take the latter. It then goes into a lot of detail about the conditions of service for the average sailor. So things like prize money, regular pay, and of course the discipline as well. And we mentioned earlier those different ranks, those different types of officer. Of course, the same applied for your regular sailors as well. They could be artificers, carpenters, sail makers, rope makers, armourers, coopers, stewards, clerks, cooks. Now, discipline was a big thing at the time, of course. So the next section looks at mutinies and desertions, disobedience, mass disobedience. There were a number of mass mutinies or people protesting against some of the terrible extreme conditions, of course. There are a number of famous mutinies and episodes uh, that actually did help improve the conditions for the ordinary sailor quite a lot. Then we're into the section on techniques. Uh, if you want to learn how to sail a frigate <laughs> and you've got a crew and a ship, then this will tell you how. It goes into a, a lot of detail again. I've got all the different types of knots there, how the sails are hung. 
how ships are handled. Obviously, wind direction plays a huge part in uh, the direction you can go, but also what sails you put up as well. And then we're into the section, what we might call the business section of gunnery and fighting. Again, some wonderful paintings there. That's the Carronade crew at the bombardment of Algiers in 1816. We've got gun crews on the victory. And then if you want to get a feel for the period, so from a gaming perspective, that doesn't really affect your naval battle so much, but perhaps if you were getting more into sort of RPG gaming in this particular era, this really gives you the feel for life at sea. Boxing matches, they're talking about women on board the ship there. And the old tradition of crossing the line. Then it gets a bit grim because we look at medicine. <laughs> there you go. Look at that for the doctor's instruments. That doesn't bode well, does it? And then we get more into the war gamey aspects. There's our fleet distribution, May 1795, June 1808. So again, some real good information here for war games, particularly campaigns. And then we get into the actual fleet tactics. So again, all very useful stuff. And there's Nelson's fleet at the Battle of the Nile. I wonder if this is one of the most uh, painted. I wonder if this particular era, this particular uh, type of action, if you like, is one of the most painted. Seems to be a lot of naval battle paintings. I know you get paintings from Waterloo and those kind of things. But there does seem to be a huge preponderance of ship paintings. Was the Navy the most important branch of our armed forces back then, I wonder? That's the approach to the Battle of Trafalgar. Uh, and, and again, this next section is very useful for gamers because it talks about the tactics, but also the different roles that ships could play. So we've got, of course, ship-to-ship -ship battles. That might be individual, that might be fleet or squadron. But we've also got things like cutting out missions. We've got blockades. We've got pursuits. So lots of ideas there for your war game scenarios. Convoys and escort duties. Even how the convoys would have been organized. And then it rounds off with reports of actual battles, how they went, what was done, and also the consequences. There's a nice section here on victory and defeat. Their surrender at Camperdown. Uh, what happened to prisoners, for example? What happened to an admiral or an officer whose ship surrendered? But also what happened to the ships as well? So this is the York, which by 1828 had been converted into a convict ship. I guess that wasn't uncommon for the ships that fought at Traf uh, Trafalgar and the like. And there's a nice shot of the victory at Portsmouth today, which of course you can go and visit uh, absolutely essential visit, I would suggest, if you're into this period of war gaming. That's it. So there's our appendices. Again, it gives you the crew figures for several different types of ship. So our second book is somewhat thinner, somewhat smaller, certainly a lot lighter. Building and Detailing Model Sailing Ships by Georgie Campbell, A-M-R-I-N-A, in collaboration with Model Shipways. So this is the UK edition, first published in 1978, though it dates back to 1962. It's uh, an American book. This booklet is a guide to techniques of modelling from a wood kit. And the scale it advises, he said, the most popular kit scale is one eighth of an inch equals one foot, which works out about one ninety sixth scale. So that's quite considerably larger than my Navwar one twelve hundred models. So we go from the basic ship outline and the whole structure through to things like gun ports, 
all the various different rails and fittings. Nice little section on figureheads there. It says Elizabethan ships often had a lion or dragon as their figurehead. I guess that changed over time and uh, you get into some quite elaborate figureheads on later ships. A lot of details on capstans and windlasses. And then of course the big thing for this type of model work, the rigging. So extremely detailed section here on all your rails, your slings, your trusses, your yards. And look at that, even just your bowsprit there, the amount of detail that goes into what's basically a bit of wood sticking out the front of the ship. <laughs> but all the fittings and lines that go into that. And you may already know, but the, the rigging is divided into two things. Your standing rigging, that's what supports the masts and the yards. And that wasn't often adjusted. Then you have the running rigging. Those are the ropes that run through your blocks. So that's what's used to pull up the sail to adjust the sail. And the standard rigging was normally coated in tar to reinforce the, the structure, reinforce the strength. Your running rigging is your, your normal sort of rope. So that's why your standing rigging on models is always seen as black and your running rigging is a, a, a sort of light brown colour. So there we go, quite an old book that one, but absolutely packed with detail if you're looking at getting into serious model ship building. As I say, for one twelve hundred scale, most of this is totally redundant. But nonetheless, I think it's interesting to see how these amazing ships were put together how they run, how they operate. And this is one of those things that time and money and space and lack of cats aside, I would one day love to make that scale model of uh, even just a frigate or something like that, because those models really always do look spectacular. So two quite different books there, one on a very practical level about how to build and detail your models, and the other one, I have to say this is the most comprehensive overview I've seen of naval warfare at the time. So although some things in there won't directly relate to building your models or wargaming, the background information is also very useful, I feel. Uh, it helps you get a sense of the atmosphere of the times, of the conditions that a lot of these sailors worked under, fought under and died under. And so I really like a lot of those evocative old pictures in there as well. Model sailing ships, I should imagine, is out of print. So that's going to be a second-hand copy if you find. Nelson's Navy, I think, is still available if you go through uh, your normal re retailers on the internet or in the high street. I'm pretty sure you can order this up. And, of course, I'm sure there's a lot of second-hand copies available as well. If you're into naval Napoleonic warfare, then you really need this book. OK, that's it for today. Thanks for watching. As always, any comments, questions or suggestions, please let me know and I'll see you next time.